in the gospel reading, can you hear, hear me now? Is that good? Okay. In the gospel reading for today from John, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea, asked Jesus this question. Are you the king of the Jews? Well, at that time, the Jews already had a king that had been appointed by Rome to help keep the peace. And this king was not a descendant of King David. But his name was Herod of Antipas. And he was one of the three sons of Herod the Great. Now, Herod the Great, if you remember, was the king that had been visited by the wise men who were following the star of the new king of the Jews that had been prophesied would be the anointed one or the Messiah. Any of you know about Epiphany? <laughs> okay, that's what we celebrate in Epiphany. That's what Epiphany is all about. The celebration of the wise men following the star. And Herod the Great was the one who um, found out from the wise men that Jesus, that the Messiah was being born in Bethlehem, if you recall. And, and so after the wise men left and didn't return to tell him where they had found the child, he sent his uh, soldiers into the village there in Bethlehem and destroyed all of the male children two years and younger in an attempt to try and destroy, to kill the Messiah, the Son of God. Well, it didn't work out, as we all know, because an angel of God had warned Jesus, his adopted early, earthly father, Joseph the carpenter, a dream. And so the Holy Family had escaped in the middle of the night and fled to Egypt, where they had lived until the death of Herod the Great. Well, now we have a Roman soldier who has also been appointed by Rome, just as Herod the Great was, and asking Jesus if he was the king of the Jews. Because he knew that the Messiah was the true heir to the throne of David. And Governor Pontius Pilate was quite familiar with the Jewish prophecies and also of the rage of Herod the Great in seeking to destroy anyone, even his own children, and, or, and the Messiah from taking the throne. What neither King Herod the Great nor Pontius Pilate understood was that the Messiah's kingdom was not like an earthly kingdom. This same mistake continues to be made by those who follow false doctrines that teach God's kingdom will be established on earth by the followers of Christ as an earthly kingdom. Have you all heard that? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Okay. All right, so I'm not talking out of my head, right? I mean, <laughs> y'all really know about this going on. You've heard these stories, right? Well, Jesus' response to Pontius Pilate is also a response to the followers and advocates of these heresies, because that's what they are. They're false teachings. They're heresies. Jesus replies, and listen carefully again, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. I don't know how many times he needed to say that for us to get it. <laughs> okay, it's not from here. So, from where does Jesus' kingdom come? In the Old Testament reading for today from the book of Daniel, we read... Thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. And the prophet Daniel goes on to describe the ancient one, and, and from his description, it's quite clear that Daniel is talking about God Almighty. And the setting that Daniel witnesses is a courtroom of judgment at the end of days. After the beast that tormented humanity is put to death, and the other beasts are imprisoned, this impressive figure arrives and is given authority over the earth and all of its inhabitants. And Daniel writes, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away and his kingship is one that shall 
never be destroyed. Well, according to the scriptures, it is Jesus the Christ who fulfills this prophecy. In today's epistle reading from Revelation to the seven churches in Asia, John writes, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. It is Christ alone who is the king of kings. And as his followers, we're not here to set up an earthly kingdom. Instead, we have been called to be his witnesses and to serve in his priesthood. How many here knew you were priests? My husband knows. <laughs> You know, you read the scriptures, the peculiar priesthood. Does that ring a bell? That's right. Well, the apostle John states that Christ made us to be a kingdom priest. That's us, all of us, serving his God and Father. We who belong to Christ have been ransomed from our sins through the blood sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross. See, Jesus willingly made this great sacrifice to set us free from the bondage of sin. And it was because of his love for us that he did this. It is in response to Christ's great love for us that we gladly turn to him to serve him. We show our love for Christ in several ways, in many ways in fact, in keeping his commandments of love and in sharing the good news of his salvation and living our lives for Christ. And this does not mean that when we share the good news of salvation that all will believe and be saved. How many of you have ever been disappointed in evangelizing? How many ever evangelized? <laughs> Well, I'm here to tell you that's what we've been called to do. You don't have to go to seminary and get ordained to be a priest. You are all priests. You got that? Did you know if I fell over dead and we were doing a baptism, one of you could get up and do it? Do you realize that? That's in the prayer book. It's right there. In Jesus, well, I baptize in Jesus, his name too. <laughs> I don't just do it off the top of my head and baptize in my name. <laughs> baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Father? You know the Father God? Do you know he's your Father? You have the Holy Spirit? You have Jesus in your heart? You got it. You're a priest. Now, we've all been called to do different ministries on earth. Some of us have been called to, to set aside our lives and just do priest work. Okay? The rest of us are called to be out there in the world and doing other things to witness. You're the ones that are really on the ground. You're the ones that are out there with the people every single day. I mean, when I walk down the street and they see my collar, they go, well, there goes a priest or minister, whatever. But you're the ones right there. You're right there rubbing shoulders with people. And they need to see Christ in all of us. And it is our, and so our task as members of Christ's priesthood is to spread the gospel to everyone. Now scripture tells us we're to spread it to all peoples, nations, and tribes. But it would be nice if we just got started with the people in our homes, the neighbors next door, the people we work for, work with, work for us, the person sitting there having coffee with you, our friends. Do you know all your friends know Jesus? That's your job, to find out, to share Christ. That's all of our jobs. See, we have been assigned to win the world to Christ by winning people's hearts for Christ. 
by sharing the Christ who lives through us and in us. It's not just the ordained priest who's the evangelist. Each and every one of you have been given that assignment in the Great Commission. Did you know that? Here's our evangelist for our services in our church, right there. Our Christopher, who gave me his rope today. <laughs> that's, his, that's his special ministry. He has a special gift for evangelism. But each one of you here who has Christ within you and is listening is an evangelist for Christ. We all have that within us. Have you ever, you know, so I was really disappointed yesterday when my game lost, my team lost the Florida State Seminoles, you know, I was I was really down, <laughs> but I, I just want you to know that I was cheering for them, even though they weren't winning. And you know, as Christians, we don't always win our friends and loved ones to Christ, but we plant those seeds. And so my hope is that next time Florida State will win. <laughs> You know, I don't stop watching Florida State because they lost one game. They're my team. Well, just because you go out and evangelize, now oh, I came home today, no one came to Christ. Boy, I really failed. I guess I'm not supposed to do that anymore, huh? What do you think? No. <laughs> Our, what we're called to do is to tell others about Christ. And as his priests, we all have much work to do. There's a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus. Did you know that 20% of the people in America don't even have a religion? They're known as nuns, N-O-N-E. They write down none for religion. Yeah, we're doing really well out there. We're just, you know, growing by leaps and bounds. Not. We're worse shaped now spiritually in America than we were when we started. And with each passing day, the day of Christ's return draws nearer. And our window of time for sharing the gospel becomes less and less and less. And instead of increasing in passion for the lost, many in the church have become apathetic as the time for winning souls for Christ comes to a close. You realize one day that door's gonna go, it's gonna shut. There'll be no more time for evangelizing. Well, as the church falls asleep is what I like to call it. This is just the opposite of what we need to be doing. Yet, sadly, it's also a fulfillment of prophecy that in the end times, Many believers' hearts will turn cold and they will forsake Jesus' mission for the lost. They will turn to other gods and forget the first love of Christ. Anybody know anybody like that? You don't have to raise your hand. Well, sadly, these will also be those who will cry out in agony at Christ's return. Oh, no. I didn't do it. I didn't tell my brother. I didn't tell my friend down the street. And now it's too late. They will cry out in agony of Jesus' return because they knew the truth and they chose to turn away from it. Or as I like to say, they just kept postponing it. I'll tell them later. I never got to get that into the conversation today. You know, we we're talking about other things that were so important. Sadly, the, they will not be alone, for many will hear of Christ's saving grace and reject the only one who can save them. And of Christ's return, the Apostle John writes in Revelation, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will, to say, rejoice. No. It says, will wail. 
W-A-I-L. That is great grief and sorrow. Great agony. Yes, the day is coming when the King of Glory will return to claim his kingdom and rule over the earth. Yet it will be not like any earthly kingdom because only the faithful will live in the kingdom of God. Those whose names are not found in the book of life will be judged by the very Christ that many of them have rejected. What a sad and frightening day for those who will not be allowed to enter into the kingdom of God. May I also say for those of us who did not witness to them. Because the saints will watch as those who are not in the book of life and who have been judged by Christ to not enter into his kingdom. The saints will watch as these are sentenced to eternal damnation and torment. Is it worth being polite to your best friend and not tell them about Christ now? Or would you rather watch them thrown into hell forever? And you have no thing you can do about it then, knowing that you could have made a difference. You could have at least tried. As for those who will be allowed to enter into the kingdom of God, it will be great joy. For those who live in the kingdom of God, there is life everlasting, life with no end. All who dwell within this kingdom will worship Christ the King, not out of duty, but out of love. Because under the rule of Christ, there will be no more sorrow. After the judgment, after we've seen those souls cast into hell forever, the scriptures tell us that God will wipe away all tears, possibly memories. We won't even remember that loved one that we didn't tell about Jesus be gone from our souls, our minds forever, lest they bring us pain. No more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death. All will live in harmony with God and with one another. No more bickering. No more I can do that better than you. be worshiping the King of Kings in joy and love and gratitude for what he has done and for who he is. And this is why we pray the Lord's Prayer. How many pray the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> well, hopefully you prayed at least once a week in church on Sunday. <laughs> and in the Lord's Prayer we pray Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's because we are praying for God's kingdom to come. We are praying for Christ to return. We are praying for him to come back, the Prince of Peace. For only then, only then will the inhabitants of the earth know the true peace, the real peace that only Christ can give. <clears throat>